how much protein do we actually need to build and maintain muscle as we age? When you think about that question, how do you go about reviewing and summarizing the evidence base that we have? So a lot of people will mention things like this term muscle protein synthesis, which is sort of this action of of putting protein into muscle or building muscle that can be measured in certain ways. Um, You'll have people talking about the availability of amino acids in your bloodstream after consuming protein. But what I like to look at is what we're ultimately talking about here. How does the protein intake actually impact muscle gains or strength gains? And so we have plenty of randomized controlled trials now where one group will be consuming a lower protein diet and another group will be consuming a higher protein diet. Now, one of the most famous meta-analyses on this, it was done by Morton et al. And, and a guest, a previous guest of yours, Stu Phillips, was on that paper as well. Um, and they found that as you increase protein intake when paired with resistance training, the sort of break point or the, uh, the point where that curve flattens out is around 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight, or that's roughly 0.75 grams per pound of body weight. Now, there are there was a lot of variability in the results of the trials that were included there, and, and some of the trials do look like there was maybe differences in calorie intake or weight gain between groups. So there are it's a little bit messy in some ways. But following that, there was a meta-analysis just a few years ago by Tagawa and colleagues. And they did a really good job excluding studies where there were differences in weight gain or weight loss. And and they had a much more narrow range of results, so it wasn't quite as varied. And they found, at least for strength outcomes, that if you pair protein at 1.5 grams per kilogram of body weight with uh, resistance training, that's sort of the peak. And beyond that doesn't lead to further benefit, at least for strength outcomes. And in that paper from memory, the majority of the strength was achieved at a protein intake around 1.2 grams. It certainly went up to 1.5 a little bit more, but most of it, the steepest part of that curve was achieved from very low protein intake to about 1.2. Well, I think that's pretty consistent across the data as well. Like, I think that's something that gets left out a lot is that, um, and, and I know Stu Phillips has used this example, I know you've used this example, where you think of it as sort of wringing out a wet towel. You know, you get most of it by those few initial kind of rings, but once you get to the last little bit, you're really just squeezing the last few drops out. That's sort of the difference between like 1.2 grams per kilogram and 1.6 grams per kilogram. So, you know, if you're somebody looking to maximize muscle and strength gains, yeah, 1.6 or 1.5 is an excellent target. But for the general public, do you need to go that far necessarily for what are ultimately modest additional gains? Probably not, but I think that's an individual decision to make. And also, actually, on the Tagawa paper, something I'll mention is in those studies where there wasn't resistance training, so where they just jacked up protein but didn't have people lifting weights or doing bodyweight exercises, there was next to nothing. Um, So protein itself doesn't seem to really promote muscle. You need to actually work for it as well. That seemed to also be something that Stuart Phillips was involved in the the 2022 meta-analysis of looking at this exact question where they looked at protein and body composition as well as strength in adults under 65 and over 65. And one of the comments that they made a few times in there was that the as you increase protein, the, the, the effect is very, very small on muscle mass across the board relative to resistance training. And I think that gets lost in these conversations, like the conversation that Peter Atia had recently with Rhonda Patrick, where there's all of this emphasis on consuming two two plus grams of protein per kilogram. Why, why do you think that Peter has that recommendation of, of kind of consuming well north of these numbers that we're seeing in these studies? So I don't know exactly where he's gotten that idea, but I, I know a few places that, that that tends to come from. So if we go back to that Morton meta-analysis I talked about earlier, like I said, there was a lot of variability in the results. And if you were to be let's say generous and take the the highest end you know th- those those particular studies where they saw benefit with the highest protein intake there were some studies suggesting going up to like 2 or 2.2 grams per kilogram could potentially be superior however as i mentioned there are differences in calorie intake between some of them there are some differences in weight gain between some of them so there are some issues there at the same time we also know that if you are in a calorie deficit so if you're trying to lose weight but hold on to muscle actually going higher with protein to that range of 2 2.2, maybe even two and a half grams per kilogram could be helpful. But again, that's a very specific context. So maybe that's where he's getting it from, but it doesn't make sense to 
to use that for the general public. I'm going to read out an email that Stuart sent me today. Okay. Because I think he might even push back on that. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, and, and, and I think that that was perhaps Stuart Phillips, perhaps that was a view of his previously around maybe increasing protein intake if you're in a calorie-restricted okay. state. He says, and I asked him, I said, is there any evidence that consuming 1.6 grams per kilogram is significantly better than 1.2 grams? So not comparing 1.6 to like 0.8, which are the, the guidelines, but comparing it to 1.2, which is closer to where people are actually landing naturally in Western populations. And he says, Simon, strongly no, but evidence there is is attached. The degree of debate over 1.2 to 1.6 grams of protein, however, amounts to an additional 15 to 25 grams of protein per day, depending on body weight. Scorched earth nuance, in my opinion. <laughs> What is very clear, at least to me, is that it is ridiculous to be consuming 2.2 grams per kilogram or one gram per pound or more. There is no evidence to support this, even in energy-restricted states and even for muscle. Wow. Okay. There um, you have it. So pretty strong position. And I did, it was a little counterintuitive to me that in that meta-analysis where he was, they looked at the optimal amount of protein consumption to support muscle mass body composition in adults over 65 and under, the optimal amount for young adults was at 1.6 grams per kilogram or greater. So that that level that we see in the Morton analysis. But for older adults, it was actually lower than that. It was between 1.2 and 1.59. Despite, I guess, an, a general kind of consensus view out there being that as we age, we develop anabolic resistance. And I had thought that if anything, elderly would require more protein. Yeah, that is a common thought. But what's really interesting is if you look at the trials on elderly and protein intake, they don't tend to be all that convincing of, you know, these super high protein intakes being beneficial. Why that is, I'm not entirely clear because as you suggested, even moderately increasing to that like 1.2 range or so seems to be beneficial, but perhaps it has to do with minimizing intakes of other important nutrients. Perhaps it's a diet quality issue. It's just not super clear. And so if we take that that 1.2 to say 1.6 gram kind of range, maybe the upper end of that, if you are a young adult and really striving to to build to build muscle, if you look at a 70 kilogram person, just to make this super practical, 1.2 grams per kilogram is 84 grams of protein a day. And 1.6 is 112 grams of protein per day. So to Stuart's point, like that's approximately a 30 gram difference, depending on whether you're targeting the bottom end of that range or, or the top end. But both of those numbers being 84 grams of protein a day or 112 is substantially less than those recommendations from PETA that are at you know two grams of of protein per kil kilogram per day, with a with really a, a strong kind of bias towards animal protein. It seems it seems like an un unscientific position to take. Yeah, I would just like to see what evidence he would cite for that. I've listened to some of the same sort of podcast episodes that you have on this, and. I hear those claims a lot, but I never really see good evidence supporting it unless someone is taking, say, the Morton meta-analysis and just picking the highest values they can out of that. Um, so, yeah, I've just asked for the evidence. I think his his point now that I, I recall that latest conversation was that what's the harm? You know, show show me the evidence that there is harm. And that, to me, unless you're willing and open to look at the observational epidemiology, which I'm not sure that he is, it's a hard, it's a hard question to answer. Yeah. And, and I would also say that there's, there's potential harm just in the sense that that would actually take a lot of effort. Like the, the amount of energy and effort that would have to be put into consuming that amount is a whole lot more than say 1.2 or 1.3 grams per kilogram or something along those lines. And then also we have to consider source, which I know we'll get to, but you know, if you're really emphasizing a lot of the red meats and those types of things, well, then that's potentially problematic as well. But the take home point there being that the strongest evidence that we have doesn't really support this idea of once you're going up above 1.6 grams per kilogram, doesn't support the idea that that is in any way contributing to more muscle mass or strength. 
you know, at least at least it's not detectable in, in the studies that we have that have been repeated over and over and over. The average person is starving their microbiome every single day and in turn, robbing themselves of their best health. Enter 38 Terra's Daily Microbiome Nutrition, or DMN. What's DMN, you ask? Well, who better to explain than 38 Terra founder and gastroenterologist, Dr. Will Bolsowitz. Thanks, Simon. DMN is a daily prebiotic blend we created to nourish your gut microbes with exactly what they need to thrive. We used rigorously studied ingredients like actazin kiwi fruit powder and solenol resistant starch, both of which have been shown in clinical research to feed the beneficial bacteria, improve regularity, and support digestion and immune health. Of course, we've left out the sugar and the unnecessary fillers that you find in so many other products. And what you end up with is the most complete prebiotic that I know of on the market today. In fact, this is the product that I've always wanted for my patients. Support your gut health today in the most practical, science-backed way with DMN. Simply head to 38terra.com. That's the numbers 38tera.com and use the coupon code, the proof at checkout for 10% off. 